With so many stories across so many cultures throughout the world, it's inevitable that some of these tales will be similar to one another. But every now and then, there are two stories from completely different cultures that share a rather surprising number of similarities, like the Greek tale of Orpheus, the musician who lamented his lost love, and the Japanese tale of Izanagi, the god who would not accept the death of his wife. In what way are these two tales similar? Well, the best way to answer that is to tell them to you. Orpheus was a poor boy, son of Apollo, the god of music, and as such, he played the most beautiful music humanity had ever heard. Wherever he went, the melody from his lyre entranced all who heard it, and they felt a happiness unlike anything before. One day, when Orpheus was playing in the woods, his music attracted a beautiful wood nymph towards him. Her name was Eurydice, and just as she was captivated by his song, he too was captivated by her. They fell in love, and it was not long before they were married. The two were very happy together, which makes it all the more tragic that their marriage did not last long. For one day, while running in the woods, Eurydice stepped on and was bitten by a venomous rattlesnake, and so she died. Orpheus was not the same after losing Eurydice. He no longer wanted to play, or sing, or even live. He was just empty without her. He mourned and he mourned until he realized there was one person who could give her back to him. The ruler of the underworld, Hades. With the help of his father Apollo, Orpheus found a way into the underworld and began an extremely long and difficult journey to the House of Hades. Now, the underworld is an incredibly deadly place that no ordinary mortal can survive, but Orpheus was no ordinary mortal. Throughout his entire journey, he played his music. This was something that had never happened in the underworld before, and its forces did not know how to react. They did not attack Orpheus because they wanted him to keep playing. The souls who had been tortured for years suddenly felt their pain lessen. Sisyphus forgot the aches in his muscles. Tantalus forgot the hunger in his belly. Even Cerberus was tame and made no attempt to harm Orpheus. When Orpheus reached his goal, Hades and his wife Persephone were waiting for him. They were moved by his song and by his dedication to his wife, but Hades still knew that he could not just hand over Eurydice so easily. Doing so would be unfair to the other souls and break the very laws of nature, so he came up with a compromise. He told Orpheus, You may have your wife but you may not look at her until you have left the underworld. She will walk behind you the whole way, and if you turn to look at her just once before reaching the surface, she will return here and remain forever. Orpheus agreed to this and began the journey back, but the further he went, the more he realized he had no way of knowing if Eurydice was actually with him. Doubt began to overtake him. What if Hades lied? What if this was just a clever way for him to get rid of me? What if everything I did was for nothing? And as he neared the end of his journey, he could take it no more. He turned around and saw the beautiful face of his wife staring at him lovingly for a brief moment before she vanished, taken by Hermes back to the underworld. Orpheus had failed Hades' test to see if his love was stronger than doubt. Long, long ago, near the beginning of time, two gods came into being, and their names were Izanagi and Izanami. They were brother and sister, but also soon fell deeply in love and became husband and wife. Hey, don't judge, there was nobody else around. Together, they created the islands, the mountains, the trees, and the rivers of the world, and from their union birthed the many deities who would maintain the forces of nature. Izanami birthed wind gods, plant gods, water gods, and so on, beings to help life grow and spread throughout. But eventually it was clear that if only creation and growth existed, 
there would eventually be too much stuff and not enough room. So in order to maintain balance, Izanami birthed Kagutsuchi, the god of fire and a force of destruction. But Kagutsuchi turned out to be more deadly and destructive than expected, for when Izanami birthed him, his flames burned her so badly that she later died of her wounds. Izanami was the first being to die, and Izanagi did not know how to handle it. He was so overcome with grief that he took his powerful sword, Totsuko no Surugi, and decapitated Kagutsuchi. But even in death, his flames remained. Izanagi could not move on from Izanami. His wife had been his only equal, the only one who could ever understand him and truly make him happy. He mourned and mourned until he realized there was a place he could find her. Yomi, the Underworld. Now, the Underworld is an incredibly deadly place that no ordinary being can survive. But Izanagi was no ordinary being. He was the great creator god, one of the oldest deities in Japan, and he traveled countless miles through the underworld, sword in hand, constantly attacked by all manner of monsters. He simply cut down every last one of them. They didn't matter to him one bit. He thought only of his wife. At long last, Izanagi reached the palace of Yomi and finally found his wife. He could not make out her features, for the underworld was very dark, but still, he knew it was her. He was so happy to finally be with her again, and she was thrilled at what her husband had gone through just for her. But she told him that she could not leave, for she had eaten the food of the underworld, and thus was bound to it forever. Izanagi asked her if there was any way, anything they could do, and Izanami told him, that the only way for her to leave now was to get permission from the ruler of Yomi. And then she said, I will go into the palace and try to convince him to let me leave, but you must promise me one thing. Promise me you will wait here and not enter the palace until I return. You must be patient. Izanagi promised, and so his wife entered the palace and he waited. And he waited. And he waited. A whole day went by, and he waited. And his patience was wearing thin. He wanted to know what was taking so long. Eventually, he could take it no more, and he broke his promise. He lit a torch, and he entered the palace. As he searched through the palace, he saw a form in the distance. As he got closer, he realized it was his wife asleep, but... There was something different about her. He closed in and looked at her face, and what he saw caused an emotion he had never felt before. Fear. His once beautiful wife had now rotted away. Her skin was dead, covered in maggots. Her face was hideous and horrifying. She was decomposing and had strange liquids oozing in and out of her. And weirdest of all, there were tiny thunder deities emerging from her body. Even in death, Izanami was still giving birth to new beings. Izanagi screamed and ran away, which woke Izanami, and she was enraged to discover that her husband had betrayed her. She sent her newborn children after him and summoned monsters to stop him as well, but Izanagi fought them off as he ran. He fought his way into the underworld, now he would fight his way out. He made it to the surface, and Izanami could not follow, for as said before, she was bound to the underworld. And that was when Izanagi realized, the dead must remain dead. They do not belong in the world of the living. But he learned this lesson too late. His actions had enraged his wife, and from that day forward, Izanami became the Hag of the Dead, who ensured every day that a thousand people would die. These two stories share some very interesting similarities, which you've probably noticed by now. Both involve a man losing his wife before her time. In both stories, the man can't accept her death and makes a long journey through the underworld to get her back. 
Both men reach a palace in the underworld where they need to get permission from its ruler to get their wife back. Both men fail a test of patience and look at their wife's face when they're not supposed to, which results in the wife not being able to return to the land of the living. And of course, neither story has a happy ending. One detail I find very interesting in the Japanese story is that Izanami says she cannot leave the underworld because she has eaten the food. That detail isn't in the Greek tale of Orpheus, but it is in the Greek tale of Persephone, so that's another interesting similarity between these two cultures. Of course, there are plenty of differences as well. Orpheus and Eurydice are not gods, nor are they siblings. Orpheus uses his music to safely traverse the underworld, while Izanagi just fights his way through it. And of course, Orpheus had his wife taken from him at the end, whereas Izanagi chose to not be with his wife anymore. How do you think all this came about? Do you think one culture influenced the other? Could this just be a massive coincidence? Or do you believe that some version of this actually happened and it was interpreted two different ways by two different groups? Let me know your thoughts, and please tell me if you know of any other shockingly similar stories.